Should I start? Yes. Okay. Okay. So hi everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting us to to talk to you guys. Um, my talk uh, is a, a you know, high level introduction to, to Algorand. Um, before I want to give a, a one couple of minutes presentation, introduction to myself, because uh, there is some things that in my history that relate to this. I am a cryptographer. I've been working for too many years in the, the theory and applications of cryptography. Uh, spent time in academia and industry, most of the time as a, a researcher at IBM Research in New York. I've been to the Algorand, the Algorand Foundation since 2019, actually. Uh, my group and I started the foundation. I, I was the, one to, the first to be on board, so I called myself employee number one. That's only half joke. Uh, but my, the point that I want to make is that I feel that I was very lucky to live through the years of the internet, internet revolution in the 90s, when the internet came out from being an academic network to commercial, uh, the, the, the World Wide Web started, and you know everything else after that is, you know, is, is all, all, all you know. And being early in a, in, in a technological revolution like the internet gives you a unique opportunity to influence uh, in my case, uh, the security and cryptography standards uh, of the time, when things uh, evolve and are more mature, it is harder to have an impact that will be, you know, so uh, widely as as when you can do it at the beginning. And <clears throat> so it's exciting to live in times of change, especially when change that changes people's lives for the better, hopefully. Uh, and I'm saying that we are again in such times. And that's the reason I am here. And by here, I mean in, in, in the blockchain area, in, in, in the Algorand Foundation, and even in this talk, presenting this to you, because this message is something that I want to carry to you. Uh, it's, it, it's the same. You are living the, the blockchain revolution as I did in the 90s. So since the moment, there is some uh, wonderful applications to be developed in the, uh, on blockchains. Uh, that again, hopefully, will change the people's lives for good, and uh, I encourage you to be part of of of, of this change. So again, the, the talk is about a, a conceptual introduction to the algorithm technology, very partial, very high level. But you know, I want to show you some of the basic elements that that point to the magic and innovation behind this technology. And in, in, as, as a motivation and as an example, I'll, I'll show how these uh, new elements in Algorand contribute to a reduction in electricity consumption, you know, 10 million times less than Ethereum, 100 million with respect to Bitcoin, uh, fees that uh, in, 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 in Ethereum go from, let's say, $2 to $30 in Algorand are just one tenth of a cent. And confirmation time goes from five to 10 minutes in uh, oh, okay. Ethereum Bitcoin to just four and a half seconds in, in Algorand. What's your first name? Gloria. And UK. Someone has to mute. Um, so, and all of these not only uh, gives you a uh, very significant performance improvement, but actually lead to the to the important properties of scalability, security, and decentralization in the network. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, in the next talk, Fabrice uh, will uh, be presenting a more technical presentation about uh, developing on, on the algorithm platform, in particular, uh, the, the properties and the, the, the technicalities behind smart contracts. Okay, so uh, I assume you all, all know what the blockchain is. Uh, just to repeat the basics, any blockchain is a, a ledger of uh, transactional data, typically represented as a chain of blocks, not necessarily, but that's a typical way of doing this. And this, uh, this chain of blocks uh, as a database is distributed across uh, a system of uh, multiple uh, nodes in, 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 in a large network. Uh, there is always some set of rules for this network, this uh, set of, net of nodes to agree 
on the next block. That's called a consensus protocol. And uh, this database has the properties. And we are talking here about permissionless public uh, blockchain. So the, the data is publicly verifiable and transparent, permissionless and uh, tamper proof. proof. Um, again, one of the things that, uh, uh, as I said, every blockchain has a consensus. This may vary very, very strongly between different blockchains, but the basics is that there is usually one party that chooses a block, that's a block proposer. That block proposer that wins that role in some way propagates the block that it chooses to all the, network, the nodes in the network. The nodes check the block for correctness of transaction, transactions and the fact that the proposer had the right to be the proposer. And if all of this uh, works, then uh, that block is the one that is being added by the blockchain and agreed by anyone in the network. Okay, so uh, this is really very, very high level. Uh, Nakamoto in, the, in, in, in this uh, Bitcoin uh, paper introduced a first consensus for a network like a blockchain. I say that it's an eight page paper that changed the world. Uh, the idea, uh, there are many ideas in Nakamoto's paper, but the idea of the consensus, the basic idea is what I call reverse lottery. In what sense is reverse lottery? In a, in a regular lottery, you have people have tickets, uh, a, a winning number or a challenge is announced and the participant that has the, the, the winning ticket shows the ticket and wins the lottery. Here is a reverse lottery. Why? Because first a, a, a number, a winning number is announced, challenge, and then you let the, the participants to show the ticket, but to show the ticket, they have to do some, some work. Okay, so first the winning number is chosen, then the participants create the ticket through some, some, some work, and the, the first one to create that winning number, okay, that responds to the challenge, is the wins the lottery and wins the right to propose a block, which in the Bitcoin is rewarded with, uh, with, with, with some number of, uh, of Bitcoin. So there is uh, an incentive for part participants to actually try to win that lottery. What is crucial here is that even though creating the, the ticket takes a lot of work, verifying the ticket that it's the winning one is very efficient. This, this is a property that you need. So verifying the, the, the blockchain in the future is, uh, is efficient. Um, so the way Nakamoto implemented the idea, this idea of a lottery is using a cryptographic hash functions. So first of all, a challenge. Remember, I said a challenge is published then people work hard to get the, the winning ticket. So here the challenge is some number B, which is the hash uh, of the last block plus some other public information. So the, the number B is known to everyone in the network. Now, what is the winning ticket? And the winning ticket is num another number, let's call it T, uh, such that the hash of the concatenation of the challenge number B and the ticket number T is you know you hash it, you get an, a, a string of typically 256 bits, and there is a number D that the winner needs to get that number of zeros. For example, these days D is about 45, so you have to hash B with the number T such that the output starts with 45 zeros, and this number D is a very difficulty factor that can be changed to change the difficulty or the amount of work that needs to be spent in finding that winning ticket. How is this D decided and why it is variable? It's, it's, it's outside this, uh, the scope of this, uh, of, of, of this presentation. The, the, the important thing is that uh, this, finding this hash takes a lot of work uh, and this is needed for different reasons in particular if it was very easy that everyone could win the lottery and you want this not, not to happen, you want to have a, a, a unique or a small number of, uh, of parties that can win that lottery. 
Now, I said that an important property of this lottery is that once that you find the, the winning ticket, uh, which in this case is this value T, every, everyone can, can uh, check that you actually won the lottery by taking the public value B, the ticket number T that you're presenting, hashing it, just one hash of it, and you check that the number starts with these zeros, you know that the person that gave provided the number T is the winner. Okay? So, um, the, the, this is how you, I, I told you that in consensus you have to to, to choose a, a block proposer. This is the uh, mechanism by which Bitcoin chooses the block proposer. Uh, and I call this a beautiful, almost perfect idea, beautiful, but because of its simplicity, uh, it, you know, easiness of of of, of uh, implementation. And actually it provided uh, basically a revolutionary invention, which is a decentralized universal, universal permissionless payment system. So beautiful, but almost perfect. Why almost perfect? Because uh, it's uh, tremendously resource wasteful. Uh, to find that number T, that winning ticket, you spend trillions of hashes. And even though computing a hash is very, very fast, Computing trillions of them is not is is, is not uh, fast, and, and and think about it that the miner, every node in the network, or all of those that want to participate participate in the lit, lit, uh, lottery and try to be block proposers, everyone has to spend a huge amount of uh, computation when only one one party uh, will actually enjoy it. Um, and we call this kind of system uh, where to win the lottery, you have to spend a lot of work, uh, proof of work. That, that's the, the type of uh, blockchain to which uh, Bitcoin uh, belongs and Ethereum these days belongs to that too. And the result is that uh, it, it, it is a huge amount of energy uh, consumed by this process, essentially electricity consumption of a medium-sized country, uh, these days uh, is comparable to 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 the uh, co electricity consumption in uh, in Sweden. Okay, um, so clearly this is uh, not something we like very much. So the question is, can we do better? And um, the the dream or the the goal would be to replace this heavy computation that every node in the network has to do with very light local computation. Instead of everyone spending a lot of uh, energy, let's everyone spend very, very little uh, 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 computation local to, 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 to the node and uh, low, 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 low energy. So uh, not only this uh, would remove the waste of you know, the energy waste, but it adds to the centralization and scalability because once, you know, these days to, to, to participate and try to, to propose a block in, uh, in, in, in Bitcoin, you, you cannot do it that at, at, at your home with, with your laptop or phone. You need these, uh, you know, these mining pools because it's so time, it's so uh, energy and, and, and money consuming that it cannot be done by, 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 by small participants. Here, if we can do that, that everyone in the node can win the lottery, then this opens participation to people, you know, with, with a laptop or uh, and without, you know, the million of dollars to build a mining pool. And here we enter uh, Silvio Micali, an Algorand. Silvio Micali is the founder of Algorand. He is a Turing Award, you should, uh, called the, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. Uh, and he is inventor of many amazing ideas including zero knowledge proofs that are very, very uh, much used in the context of uh, blockchains. Um, and one of his inventor inventions is this notion of verifiable random functions that we are going to use in Algorand instead of hashing, okay? And you will see why this is a great idea and a great improvement. Okay, so, um, we also will have an, a lottery, as before, or what I call an in, inverse lottery. 
Then again, there will be a, a puzzle or cha uh, challenge published, and, uh, and people will try to find the winning ticket. Okay, but we, we, similarly to to Bitcoin in, in 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 that approach, however, to find the winning ticket in algorithm takes a fraction of a millisecond to compute. So from from trillions of hash functions to, uh, to, to, to something that costs uh, almost nothing, okay? So definitely this comes in the direction of the dream that I was uh, talking about uh, before. Uh, what, you, you find the puzzle fast and you can check that the winner, when it shows the, the winning ticket, everyone as in Bitcoin can check uh, in a very efficient way that the block proposer won the lottery and also that the, uh, the block is, is, is valid, the transactions in it are valid, okay? And all this pro process is the, called the, the algorithm consensus. Uh, because moving from trillions of hash functions of hash computation to a millisecond or a fraction of a millisecond in computing the BRF is what actually allows algorithm to be so much more efficient than Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum in, in energy consumption. As I said, also uh, being op open to everyone to participate also provides these other properties of uh, decentralization and scalability. Okay, so I, I was saying that, uh, I, I didn't explain how, but I said that this VRF, these verified random functions allow you to solve the puzzle in a, a fraction of a millisecond. So let me explain a little bit about how these verified random functions work. So each participant has a private key and a public key. The private key is secret, the public key is known to any other participant in the, in the blockchain or any participant in the consensus protocol. Now, this uh, VRF has the following properties. Um, every uh, a, a participant P can compute its own VRF. Its own VRF is defined by, by its private key, okay? So if you have a, a, v, a the VRF will compute it under two inputs, the private key of the participants and a challenge B, okay? Now, the property is that this computation for any private key and any value B outputs a random value. What does it mean a random value? A value that no one can predict before actually seeing it. And even the owner of the VRF, meaning the owner of the private key cannot bias the output of the VRF. In that sense, the output is, is random. So that's for computing the VRF. For checking the VRF, if someone gives you a pair, B and R, and it claims that R is the output of its VRF on input B, anyone can verify that indeed R is the output of the VRF on B only using the public key. Okay, so to generate the output, you need a private key, and only the owner of the private key can do that. Uh, uh, verifying it, everyone, everyone can do. And, and each one of these operations takes a, a fraction of a millisecond to compute, okay? So if we can implement the lottery using these functions, then we would have achieved this property of uh, replacing the very expensive lottery of Bitcoin with a very, very cheap uh, lottery in, in Algorand. So how, how does it work in Algorand? How do you choose uh, the block proposer? So there is a public value B that changes with each block. You can think about it of, uh, as a hash of a block. It's a more complicated value, uh, but it's public, known to everyone uh, and unpredictable. Then there is a public threshold value T that depends on the number of participants in the network. Each participant, takes the, oh, sorry, here I have a mix. Uh, you, you see that there is a VRF of private 
K output on Q. I, I change it, but not here. This should be a B. Okay. Let me do that. So we don't confuse people too much. Too much. Uh, okay, sorry. So there is this public value and there is a threshold value T. Each participant computes the VRF with its own private key on the input B and checks whether the numerical value which comes out of this VRF is less than the number T, less than the, the threshold T. If that is the case, that is my, my, the output of my VRF is smaller than T, it means that I win the right to choose the block. Okay, that's, that, that's all, all, all is needed uh, to, to, to win the lottery. Of course, as I said, this, this uh, mechanism is based on the fact that the VRF is, uh, is the output is random. It's it's uh, uh, verifiable by by everyone using a public key. Uh, so, at the end of the day, you get uh, one or a very few, a very small number of, uh, of of winners of this lottery. Uh, the same as in Nakamoto's, except that here you replace the hash based lottery with this fraction of millisecond mechanism. Uh, to compute the VRF. And again, as I said before, once you make it so simple, so cheap to participate, then everyone can do that. Uh, this provides decentralization, it provides scalability because you don't depend, uh, I mean, you can add more and more uh, users to, 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 to the network. Uh, and uh, by that, you also uh, improve security. Now, there is an issue here, which the easiness of participation has a downside, which is if everyone can participate then everyone can flood the network, you know, just to be malicious, have denial of service. So here the solution to this problem is proof of stake. As you know, proof of stake it means that in, in, in the case of Algorand, it means that the probability to be chosen as a block proposer is proportional to your stake. Where stake is the number of coins, or in the case of Algorand of algos, that the participation has. The more algos you own, the, the higher the probability is that you will win the lottery. And the way that this is done is that the threshold T, that I said, you know, you, the, the output of the VRF has to be smaller than the threshold T, that threshold is not the same for everyone, actually is proportional to the total stake that the participation a participant has. Okay, so you 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 have more algos, you have more probability of uh, choosing the next block. However, having more computational power doesn't doesn't help you. You know, I said the VRF, the the, the, the cost of computing the VRF is the same for someone that has a lot of algos or has a, a very few algos. However, the probability of winning is proportional to the stake that you have. And the idea of proof of stake, not only of algorithms, is in general is that the more skin on the game you have, if you have you know, some investment in a, in a blockchain, you want that blockchain to succeed, not to go down by, by attacking it. At least that has to be the case for a majority of the uh, owners of algorithms. Okay, so... Um, I talk about the VRF. I talk about how you uh, choose a, a block uh, proposer. Uh, now, that uh, that block proposer, I mean, we, it takes its block and it uh, propagates in in the network um, the block that it chooses and the proof that it won the lottery. I mean, it shows. I say this is a public. This is the block, this is my public key, okay? And this is the result of the VRF. Everyone can take the public key and check that the VRF under that public key is indeed the value which is smaller than T. And if that's the case, you accept the block proposer as the correct uh, proposer. And if the block is valid, meaning the transactions in it are, are, are valid, then you accept that block. However, this is a big network. Uh, there may be even more than one winner, not too many, but there may be more than one winner. 
that, uh, uh, that propagate, uh, you know, simultaneously uh, different blocks. So you need you need a consensus protocol in which, at the end of it, everyone everyone uh, agrees on the same on the same uh, block. How is it done? Uh, what happens is now a small randomly chosen committee. And when I say small, I mean independent of the size of the network. So let's say 1,000 nodes, even if the network has 10,000 uh, participants or 1 billion participants, you still take this committee of fixed size, let's say of 1,000 nodes. This is very important because again, it's an, an issue of scalability. It, the, 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 the network can increase a lot. The work for the consensus doesn't increase. The number of, 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 of participants that decide on a block is, is, is uh, independent of the total size. So that's the small net, uh, committee is chosen at random, okay? Verifies the block and votes whether to accept or reject the, the, the block. Now, how is a committee uh, uh, chosen at random? Yes, you have a million nodes. Now you are going to choose 1,000 of them at random. How you do that? Again, using the same VRF mechanism. Here you will have a, 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 maybe a different threshold, but the mechanism will be the same and everyone can check not only who the proposer is, but also who the committee that will verify and validate the block uh, who, who the participants are. Uh, a little bit uh, with, with the picture, we have the, the this process uh, being, okay, first there is a, a block uh, proposer, okay, out of all the, uh, the, 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 the nodes in the network, there is one that chooses a block. Again, as I said, there are maybe more than one. This will, this will be resolved in Algorand very easily. For example, taking, if there is two blocks that are, uh, with valid proposers, the one with the lower VRF value will be chosen. So we, we can think about one block being proposed, a small random committee chosen to look at this uh, uh, block, verify the proposal, verify the transactions on the block. If they agree that everything is fine, they move it to another committee, okay, that gets the inputs from the previous one. And if everything was uh, voted uh, correctly, then this new committee uh, certifies the new block, you know, they um, propagate to the whole uh, network the fact that yes, guys, everyone write down this block as the next uh, block in the chain because it has all been validated. And you can prove uh, mathematically using cryptography and the uh, probability theory that by doing these small uh, subsets of nodes, you still have a security that cannot be uh, um, broken uh, as long as the attacker does not uh, have a, enough of the stake in the, in the network. So, um, as I said, the, the fact that the, the, this, the number of, 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 of members in the committee is independent of the total size in the network uh, is, is, is a scalability, is a very, very important scalability uh, uh, property. And also very important is that an attacker that wants, to, you know, if I knew who the next committee uh, will be, I would be, I could go and attack this, uh, this committee either by stealing their keys or just doing denial of service and then the, doing denial of service on the whole operation of the blockchain. However, the nice thing is that the VRF is local to each uh, member. And no one knows who is going to win the, the lottery. No one knows who is the uh, next block proposer. So when the attacker sees that I was, a proposer, I was part of the committee, it's too late to attack me because I already did the work that I have to do. So this unpredictability is also fundamental to the security of the uh, blockchain. Um, okay, so all of these uh, actually shows 
uh, why, why, I mean, th there are many elements playing here, but all these elements that I talked about show scalability, talk about performance. Uh, one, one more element which is very important in, the, in Algorand is the finality. Uh, what is finality? There are no forks, uh, no, I say no stories, no worries. And to understand this, compare this to what happens in uh, Ethereum and, and, and Bitcoin and, and other blockchains where, you know, in Algorand, there may be more than one winner uh, of the lottery at the same time, but this, the consensus takes care of that and, you know, uh, it leaves you with only one. In the case of uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, the winners of also it's also the case that there may be more than one winner at a time and they create different blocks now different blocks uh, create different uh, sub chains in the network however you don't want many chains you want only one chain and what this uh, causes is that you will have to undo some of these chains so that there is this uh, notion of the longest uh, chain uh, rule that in, in Bitcoin, at the end, you really converge into a single chain. However, it takes a, a, a long time and the need to undo some of the blocks that were already validated by part of the, of the network. In uh, Algorand, you don't have any of this. There is only one block chosen for at every, uh, for, 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 for every block, there is only one chosen. There is no side chains, there is no forks. And this brings you, because of this and because of the efficiency of the VRF, from five to 60 minutes confirmation time in Bitcoin or Ethereum to just four and a half seconds. Every four and a half seconds, a block and a unique block and a final block is uh, created in, in Algorand. This is a very important property. You know, if you buy a coffee in, a, in a, a Starbucks, uh, you will have to wait uh, to five to 60 minutes. I mean, the, the seller will have to wait for five to 60 minutes until it gets the confirmation that you paid. And I think that the, by the time the coffee will be cold. So if you want, if you like hot coffee, you should use Algorand and not uh, uh, Bitcoin. Anyway, so uh, many uh, nice properties of Algorand, scalable to billions of users because of the properties that I mentioned. It's very efficient in number of uh, transactions per second. Right now, the, the network does 1,000 of them uh, for, per second. Uh, in, in a few months, we, we, we expect to have uh, 10x, I mean 10,000 of these transactions per second, four and a half seconds per block. Again, this will be reduced uh, maybe to three seconds uh, in the near future. The, the, the fees are ridiculously small, it's a one, tens of a cent, uh, or I mean, it's one thousandth of an algo, which these days is something like one tenth of a cent. Uh, there are no soft forks, uh, these side chains that I was mentioning before, uh, instant transaction finality, against I talked about that, because of the energy consumption is com uh, carbon neutral, actually there is some consumption of carbon, but uh, Algorand offsets also that since it's very low, then it's, it's not hard to offset that with the carbon credits. Uh, there is minimal hardware requirements for each node. Uh, Algorand doesn't use stake delegation or, or, or binding uh, or, or punishing people uh, for, for uh, in the process of consensus. You can participate with any st every stake, but of course, your probability of winning the lottery is proportional to the stake as in any proof of, of, of stake. Uh, the protocol is resilient at, uh, up to some uh, limits to network partitioning and also uh, against denial of service. Again, uh, security always depends on the attacker not owning too much of the stake in the, in the network. Uh, and all these properties uh, bring, you know, uh, each, each of these properties contributes in its own way to the fundamentals of a, a blockchain that can be represented by these three properties, decentralization, scalability, and security, uh, sometimes called the blockchain trilemma. It was assumed to be impossible 
to achieve uh, in the past with uh, with networks like Bitcoin, but these days Algorand can do that, and there are other uh, chains that will achieve these three properties. But again, the the elements that I talked about are those elements that are behind all of these uh, nice, um, I mean, more than nice properties that are fundamental for a secure uh, blockchain. Uh, there is much more to the to to the network. Uh, uh, I mean, we we talk about Bitcoin being a permissionless uh, pro a, a payment uh, proto a, a protocol. I was talking about transactions, one thousand transactions per second. You can think about uh, about payment uh, transactions, but actually there is much more in Algorand. Algorand has a, a, a very strong programmability properties uh, through uh, through uh, smart contracts, and, and, and Fabrice will talk, will talk about that. It has all kind of, uh, uh, of of functionalities that in in other networks you have to to build them with with more complex smart contracts, and in in, in Algorand uh, they are. Uh, built built in uh, uh, utilities, but again, uh, all these uh, beautiful stuff part of the of the Algorand technology, I uh, leave for uh, for Fabrice to talk uh, more about it. Uh, and of course, uh, the, there is a full ecosystem of uh, people and, and and applications being uh, built on on top of Algorand. Uh, I can tell you that the technology of uh, Algorand and the technology team, I am not part of it, so I can tell you <laughs> that these are amazing people, amazing protocol. There is, has been zero downtime since the launch of the of the mainnet in June of 2019, almost three years without a, a, a second of, uh, of, of downtime. This is quite, quite, quite amazing. Um, and uh, I don't have time to get into the many, many applications uh, that uh, are uh, being run or uh, experimented. A lot, a lot of the things are is is at the level of experimentation. You know, we are all learning while doing. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do great things. Uh, uh, this is a bunch of things being built. On the algorand, this is not the most up to date. So uh, there are things that are missing here, and there may be some of these uh, projects that uh, are, are not running anymore. In any case, the point is that um, we we have these decentralized finance uh, applications, you know, such as uh, liquidity pools, uh, lending, staking, all these beautiful properties. These uh, 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 decentralized exchanges. All of which can be based, uh, built on Algorand using uh, its, uh, its uh, built-in facilities and smart contracts. Uh, a lot of NFT activity, as you can imagine, in, uh, uh, lately. Um, and uh, you know, the NFTs. We have pro uh, several projects doing um, uh, copyright protection and funding of artists. Via NFTs, um, I, I have a very uh, an example of an NFT that I like a lot because it's not what we usually think about NFTs related to art. There is this uh, there is a project uh, Carnes Validas in in Argentina for uh, for producer uh, uh, cattle producers for which each cow has its own NFT. I mean a token in the pub in the in the network showing its full history since uh, birth to, 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 to death. Uh, it's, it's basically it's a supply chain uh, uh, application, but again, NFTs, each cow has its own NFT. Uh, and of course, stable coins that are needed for, for any financial uh, operation that you want to build on the blockchain. One of the, my, my favorite uh, prop, uh, uh, applications and projects are those that are uh, for social impact, for, for so environment, for good environment uh, impact. There's uh, several of these being built on, uh, on Algorand. Again, I, I wish I had more time to get into those, but you can read about them more in the, in, in, in the, uh, on the web, on the website. Okay, one thing I want to say as a final remark 
which is the importance of simplicity and elegance in technology design. Um, you know, we, we are building a technology that will be, hopefully will be used for many years. Uh, we are just experimenting, we are just learning. And it is very important that you start with something that is simple and elegant at the conceptual way, way because these are the things that are easier to maintain, easier to, to, to grow uh, over time. I have this example uh, of TCP IP. Not everyone will uh, agree that this is the most elegant of protocols, but definitely is a protocol that was designed with a few machines in mind to, co to, to connect a relatively small number of machines. And these days it's carrying uh, the whole internet with the three, uh, billions of uh, devices uh, connected to it uh, on, on, on its shoulder. So simplicity, elegance, and I believe that uh, the Algorand protocol has exactly these properties. And going back to the beginning, uh, this, uh, again, this call to action for you guys, the, 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 the young uh, people uh, to really join this, this movement, quote unquote, and you know, create uh, applications that are good, good for the world, good for the people. The Algorand Foundation, we are here to support the ecosystem and we have a strong, strong focus on students and education. We support student clubs, um, as uh, your, your club already knows, it's a priority for us and we are here. Uh, anything, any ideas, we will be happy to hear and talk and discuss. And that's my part. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Doctor. And um, it looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat. So from one from Kevin says, uh, uh, Doctor, do you think you would you want to address them right now or you prefer um, like answering all the questions all at once at the very end of the presentation? Um, let, me, let, let, let me take a, a fast uh, look. Um, uh, sorry? Let, let, uh, I'm, uh, yeah. Let me let me take a, a fast look at the uh, okay. questions. I, I may answer those that uh, uh, more directly relevant uh, to the, to the, this part, and uh, maybe we'll answer other questions at the end. Uh, the question about what's the difference between verified random functions and zero knowledge proofs. Um, I mean, these these are two. Um, two different uh, mechanisms used in different ways. There is, you know, there is uh, some conceptual zero knowledge elements in the VRF, for example, the fact that it's unpredictable. So before computing the function, no one is able to have any knowledge about the output. Once I compute it, they can show you and validate. In that sense, there is some conceptual element of zero knowledge proof. Technically speaking, these are different different mechanisms in, in, in cryptography. Um, okay, the, the reason for other blockchains having a, a side a chains a, is because the consensus protocol is not able to, uh, to, to, to kill all of, all of them at the same time. Um, Again, uh, for, for because of the, the, the properties of proof of, of work, the, the time that it takes, uh, and the, the, the way you decide on which block to accept, uh, it, it's, I mean, you know, may, maybe someone could have invented something different, but that's the way it is. And uh, it's very hard to have finality in a proof of work, a, 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 a blockchain. So that, that, that's, that's quite a fundamental reason. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, okay. This is, uh, oh, oh, Fabrice answered this. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so let me skip everything. Does algorithm infrastructure allow for cross-chain interoperability? Um, 
it, it, it allows uh, this uh, interoperability needs to be uh, built uh, in. And um, Algorand definitely it is developing uh, uh, mechanisms and facilities to facilitate this uh, cross-chain uh, interoperability. And uh, we will see more of this uh, in, in, in the future. Maybe Fabrice will want to, to say something more about that. Uh, but I think that uh, I'm, I'm done with my time and I'll let Fabrice uh, talk uh, on, on, on his part. Thank you um, so much. Uh, thank thank you. you so thank much you. for the presentation. It was really good. Um, and uh, so now let's move on to Dr. Uh, ben Hamoda. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, yeah, so I'm uh, Fabrice Bermuda and I will uh, present like more like the smart contract part of Algorand blockchain. I just want to, yeah, to have a word about the interoperability. So right now, oh, like there is a work to what's called the state proof that would allow like other blockchain to easily understand uh, the Algorand blockchain and to significantly simplify uh, interoperability between the Algorand blockchain and other blockchain. And so that's something that is developed right now, like the first phase of the project is already deployed. And then there is a second and third phase essentially that uh, that need to happen, but it's like, I, I think this year essentially, uh, even maybe uh, 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 faster than that. And that would allow like transfer between uh, um, Algorand and Ethereum, for example, quite easily and completely decentralized without a need for any central uh, authority, like any uh, trust. It would be like completely decentralized. Okay. So in this uh, presentation, uh, I want to first give a general overview of smart contract because every time I talk, I, I realize that there's sometimes confusion about <clears throat> what a smart contract can do and cannot do. And I know that you are a blockchain club, but just wanted to quickly go over this because I think it's quite important. And then I will do a deep dive into the Algorand smart contract as much as I can do. I will quickly compare to Ethereum if you're aware of it and hopefully show you quickly a demo of one uh, smart contract on Algorand. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask them. I will try to, to watch for it. Uh, okay, so what is a smart contract? So, a smart contract is really just a small program that live on the blockchain. And this small, small program can interact with the data on the chain. So the example of smart contract, like uh, uh, Hugo already talked to you about some of them, like you have the DeFi application, like decentralized finance, like for example, oh, sorry, normally in finance, you have a central uh, authority, like a central trusted party like a bank and you interact with them to uh, do your finance operation like lending, exchanges of money and things like this. But uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's completely centralized. And De DeFi actually is like a decentralized version of it where you don't need a bank, you don't need an exchange, you don't need a central exchange and you can do everything on chain without uh, the need of any central authority or and you only need to trust the blockchain at some level. Um, another example of use of smart contract is crowdfunding. You suppose that you have a project, you want to raise funds for the project. Crowdfunding is very popular uh, choice and you can do it very easily with smart contract voting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, okay, it's uh, the name give it. And uh, decentralized name services. So you all know when you go to, uh, to a web page, you type google.com and it direct you to the website of Google to the, and this uses a name service behind the scene. And this is completely centralized. Like there is an authority that uh, store all the list of all the domain to simplify. And decentralized name services allows like uh, to do the same thing, but in a decentralized way without having a central authority to manage that. Other example of user smart contract are lottery, but here is there is a star because it's actually uh, not completely straightforward. Okay. I think you already know that, but just want to repeat what a smart contract can do. Like the first thing a smart contract can do is read and write data on the blockchain. So for example, you can uh, write votes, you can write ownership of an asset, like who owns such an asset, or read or write the uh, exchange rate between two uh, cryptocurrency and things like this. 
you can also receive tokens from other accounts. Like if you have a crowdfunding uh, campaign, for example, you need to receive token from uh, users that give uh, money to your campaign or to your project. You can obviously, on the other direction, like send this token to the right person. So in the case of the crowdfunding, for example, if the campaign is successful, then you need to send the token to the uh, project owner. And finally, a smart contract can interact with other smart contracts, like both reading the value or taking action. Like, for example, a smart contract can vote on behalf of someone else for another smart contract, for example. What's very important to understand is what a smart contract cannot do. Like you see a lot in the newspaper, in the website, uh, people presenting like uh, amazing application of smart contracts, which actually most likely cannot be done. And the first example of that is a smart contract really cannot interact directly with the outside world, nor with other blockchain. Really, a smart contract is a program that lives on the chain. It's only like the only thing it sees is the chain itself. It cannot access to website, check the weather, look at the, uh, the price between the euro and the dollar. Uh, in particular, one example that often come is uh, the example of an insurance smart contract that will automatically reimburse customers after a storm. I mean, when I see that, I'm very, I'm always very doubtful because where does the information about the storm and the damage come from? Like the smart contract cannot go to your house and say, oh, this house requires $10,000 of damage. And this $10,000 of damage come from the storm. The smart contract cannot do that. Uh, you need somebody to input this data to the smart contract. And here's the reason it's for some trust. Uh, that being said, that's, even if you manually input such information in the smart contract, like there has been a storm in this uh, county and this house is in this county and require $10,000 of uh, damage like uh, to repair, it might still be useful because uh, this way you can really see that the insurance company is actually doing what they are claiming to do. But at least it's really not direct. It's not like a smart contract replaces a real contract and automatically does everything. It's impossible. And uh, another caveat to what I'm saying is that there are technology that would allow a smart contract to interact with the outside world. And these technology are called Oracle, or in the case of interaction with other blockchains, it's called a bridge. And this works, but this is quite complex. I would say that right now it's still at the infancy research state because it's very difficult to design in a completely decentralized way. Okay. Another thing a smart contract cannot do is work on any secret information. Like everything a smart contract does is public, completely public. Like, and one of the key examples that people, uh, that does not work in that context is uh, storing medical data. Like you hear often that smart contract can allow to, to store medical data on chain magically. And then magically the medical data is more secure and uh, you can authorize more easily. We can see the medical data, we cannot see it and things like this. All of that uh, with the current technology, it's essentially impossible. Uh, there are like research, but it's really research at this time uh, level solution that actually Hugo and I are part of uh, to uh, actually be able to do such, uh, such operation. But it's really, really research level. It's not at all something you can do right now. And another small caveat to this, uh, a smart contract cannot work on secret information is that if you use some technology like actually that were mentioned in the chat, like zero knowledge or ZK snark, then you can provide some form of privacy, like you can provide transaction privacy. That does not mean at all that you can store medical data. That's not possible right now. Uh, last thing that a smart contract um, cannot do is access to randomness, at least direct access to randomness. Smart contracts are completely deterministic and work on public information. How can you get randomness? It's impossible. Like it's, uh, it's as if like uh, in the current world, there is a, uh, some God or like uh, high level entity that knew exactly the state of the world and quantum mechanic did not exist. Then for this high level entity, it would be impossible. There would be no randomness. Like everything would be completely deterministic. Like smart contracts are exactly like this high level entity. They, they, they are, everything is deterministic for them and everything they see is public. So there is no randomness. Uh, the, the way you can introduce randomness is using, again, some oracles, but again, this requires new assumption of trust, like you need to trust some, somehow that this oracle uh, uh, provides some form of randomness. So 
it's a quite a complex subject. I would say it's better understood than the general oracle, but still it's not a straightforward, it's a required some more. Okay, so now that we have seen what smart contract can and cannot do, let's see how we interact with a smart contract. So smart contract is a program, it lives on chain. How do you interact? So you interact as you interact always with a blockchain, you make transaction. Like usually the only thing a blockchain can do is record transaction. So to transact with smart contract, same thing, you record transaction. And uh, this is true both for deploying the smart contract, like putting it on chain and interacting with it. Okay. So that was completely general introduction. So true so for all the blockchain. Now I'm looking a little bit more into the detail of algorithm. <coughs> still quite general, but tailored for algorithms, I want you to introduce the two notions, the notion of account and the notion of smart contract. So I'm pretty sure you all know what an account is, but I'd like to remind uh, it to you. So usually when you start using a blockchain, you create an account. And usually for you, an account will look like the following. It would be composed of one uh, public key or address. On algorithm, an address look like this, and it's completely public. You share it with your friend and things like this. And then uh, the other thing that a smart contract, uh, uh, the, an account really has is a private key. Uh, on Algorand, it looks like a 24 uh, word mnemonic. Most blockchain are very similar to that. And essentially the private key, you need to keep it uh, private or secret. And you use this secret key to, issue, to sign transaction, to approve transaction so that the transaction can be um, executed. So if you want to send a token out of your account, you will need to make a transaction, sign it using the secret key and send it. And it's essentially an account is defined by this pair of a public key and secret key. And on the chain, the account like hold the balances you have, like the token balances. And it also holds like the state of the smart contract usually. Okay, so that's the notion of account. Now, the notion of smart contract, as we have seen, a smart contract is just a program living on chain. So really a smart contract is completely different from an account, like from a philosophical point of view, if you want. Uh, an account can interact with a smart contract by sending transaction. And these transactions are signed by the secret key of the account. But really an account and a smart contract are very different. On, on algorithms are really different entities. Like on some other blockchains, they are kind of merged together like Ethereum. But even when they are merged, you, you really should think of it as two different entities. Uh, so here is how it looks an account on Algorand. For example, if you use like Algo Explorer, which is one of the blockchain explorer of Algorand. So an account has an address and it has like balances. So here we have like uh, on Algorand, you can have both like Algos, the native token and other token like USDC. And here you can see like, this is an application called transaction. This is a transfer transaction. So you have all the transaction of the account here. And an application on the other end is really just defined by an application ID, the completely different web page. So before going, um, Further, I need to introduce the notion of state, and uh, and that's really something that is general, like it's not specific to algorithms. So if you think about a blockchain, what we usually call a blockchain is, as the name indicates, a chain of blocks. So it's really a list of blocks, and each block contains transactions. The blockchain, the full blockchain, is extremely large. Like on algorithm, is close to one terabyte. On Ethereum, is more than nine terabytes. So you can see it's really, really huge. However, usually you don't need to store the full blockchain. What usually matters is the state of the blockchain. So the state of the blockchain, you can see it as a database that is stored on each node or server of the blockchain. It's much, much smaller than the full ledger or the full blockchain. And essentially it's a database which contain multiple tables. Like one table would be a, a table associating account with the balance of the account and thing like this. One table would be an application table and thing like this. Um, what's important to understand is that if you have the full blockchain, like the list of all the blocks, then you can easily, uh, you can easily, uh, sorry, one second. 
uh, you can easily uh, recompute the state of the blockchain by just executing all the transaction and storing the result like, I mean, executing the result accordingly in the database, which is the state of the blockchain. Oh, I see. Is there any reason for the number of the mnemonic and why is that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So what, what Hugo answered. Uh, so we have 25 words because we use the last word as a, as a uh, checksum so that uh, you can easily check if your mnemonic is valid or not. Like most of our blockchain actually don't include the last word, but uh, that's really a technicality. It doesn't really matter. Uh, yes, so just to see the difference between the full blockchain and the state, like if you have a transaction like Alice sending two algos, the native currency of the algo on blockchain to Bob, this is a transaction that is recorded on the full blockchain. But if you look at the impact on the state, actually the state stays the same size because the only thing that changed is that before the transaction, maybe Alice had 20 algos and Bob seven, and after Alice had 18 algos and Bob nine. So you see, it just updates the state, but it does not increase the size of the state. Some operation increase the size of the state, but in general, you don't increase it that much. That's why the state can be so much, much smaller than the full blockchain. Um, I'm not. Yeah, okay, let me give uh, an idea of what's happening on Algorand. So here now we are talking about really specific things on Algorand. So an application, as we have seen, can actually read and write state, read and write data on chain. And on Algorand, there are multiple, there are two ways essentially to, to do it. The, the first way is to use what's called the global state. So the global state is really like a, big key value uh, database of up to 64 key value pairs. And you can store things like, things like this. Like if you have a voting application, you may want a key to be tally of the votes and the value which is the number of votes and things like this. And uh, it would be represented in the state of the blockchain really in, in a very straightforward way like this in a table. So the application ID, the key and the value. Now, it's uh, interesting to remark that since you only have 64 key values, it would not be possible to store in the global state the list of all the voters in a voting application because there might be much more, many more than 64 voters. Or you cannot see it's the same way you cannot store the list of all the votes. So you are kind of limited in what you can store in the global state from this point of view. And for this reason, on Algorand, there is another way an application can store data. And this is very specific to Algorand. This is and this is called local state. Essentially, an application can store data for each account that opts into the application. And that's very convenient. For example, one thing you can store in the local state is whether an account registered is a registered voter or not, or whether they voted or not. And OK, I don't want to enter too much into the detail, but it's also all of this is also stored on the state of the blockchain. So it's very important to understand that even if it's called local state, it's not stored in the node of some weird place. It's really also stored on the state of the blockchain. So it's really on the blockchain, it's just local in the sense that it's per account. Uh, yeah, I will go quite quickly uh, on this. I don't think I don't think we I want to enter too much into the detail. What I want to just say that at a very high level is that um, the way you develop uh, a uh, decentralized application, like an application on Algorand, is two parts. One part is that you write a smart contract. So on Algorand, the smart contract is composed of two parts, an approved program and a clear program. You can forget about this detail. It does not really matter. What matters is that this program are actually written in some language called TIL, or you can use a, a wrapper, which is called PyTIL, so which allows you essentially to write your smart contract in Python. So what's happening is that you, most of the time what you do is you write some Python program and this will be converted into a smart contract. That's a smart contract part. But remember, you need to interact with a smart contract. A smart contract lives on the blockchain. Like if you leave it, let it live in the blockchain alone, nothing happens. You, you want things to happen. So you need to interact with a smart contract. And the way you do it is making transaction to the smart contract. And to do that, you can use an SDK, 
and uh, API service endpoint or AlgoD endpoint. So there are three API service endpoints, that's very easy, and there are many, many SDK on Algorand. So you can write this part of the application, like the, the part that sends the application transaction the tra to interact with the smart contract in uh, Python, JavaScript, Go, Java, C Sharp, and so on. So um, to develop an Algorand, essentially, you just need to learn you know, a bit of Python to write the smart contract, and then whatever your favorite language is, essentially, to uh, write the part of the application that interact with the smart contract. And it's important to understand that these two parts are completely independent. Like, uh, and that's the same way on Ethereum, for example. On Ethereum, you would write your smart contract in Solidity, which is a new language you need to learn. Algorand is simpler, it's Python, so much simpler. And you would write your application part in JavaScript or Python or whatever. So it's very similar to, to Ethereum, except that the smart contract part can be written in Python, which is nicer. I don't talk about that. Uh, I when, So up to now, I've just talked to you how smart contract can read and write on the blockchain. Smart contract can also um, have associated accounts on which they can store money. Remember that I said that smart contract can also like receive token and send token, and they do that using an escrow account, which is called an application account. And essentially what's happening is this, the application account is a special account. It does not have secret key, does not have... Uh, yeah, it doesn't have a secret key, it's just fully controlled by the smart contract. But like any account, it has a normal address. So people can send uh, algo token to this account, and the smart contract can also issue transaction out of this account. So that's how a smart contract can really uh, receive token and send token. Okay, I really don't have much time. I was way too optimistic, so I... I We'll skip over many things. One thing I just want to mention is that um, I guess it, uh, I guess that you you have heard about uh, ERC twenty, NFT, ERC seven twenty one, ERC one one fifty five. Like these are like token on top of Ethereum. So to, to backtrack a little bit, uh, if you know Ethereum, Ethereum has a native token, so Ether. But many projects like creating their own token on top of Ethereum. And for that, there are multiple standards to do it. Uh, on Algorand, we have the same system. You can create your own token on Algorand. But the advantage of doing that as opposed to Ethereum is that the first advantage is that you are basically having the, all the advantage of the Algorand blockchain, so much faster uh, time to commit a transaction, much smaller fees. In addition, it's much simpler to create such a uh, custom token on Algorand than on Ethereum because you don't need even to write a smart contract and you can really do it in one click in a website. Very simple. And um, also, it's yeah. Also, it's even uh, even cheaper than what you can think about it because the price to transact for a custom token on Algorand is exactly the same price as to transact with a native token. So really. This is baked in inside the protocol and it's extremely cheap and extremely well integrated. And the example of token you may want to do is you want to create a loyalty program and you want to give like loyalty points, you would create an ASA token, Algorand Standard Asset Token. Or if you want a stable coin, if you know what a stable coin is, uh, you can create it as an ASA token. Okay. Another uh, very uh, neat uh, feature of Algorand is the notion of atomic transfer. Uh, normally, I introduce this notion in relation to smart contract. I won't have time to explain you the detail why it's interesting, but it's also an interesting uh, feature on itself. So if you are on a normal, I mean, on many blockchain, you may want to exchange with uh, another person two tokens. Like for example, in this example, Alice wants uh, to give one algo to Bob in exchange to 20 USDC token. Uh, the question is, how do you do that? Because if Alice sends her one algo, Bob may just never send back the 20 USDC. And if Bob sends back the 20 USDC first, Alice may never send back the one algo. So there is a, an issue there. And the solution on Algorand is to use an atomic transfer. An atomic transfer is a way to group all the transactions together so that either all the transactions in the group succeed or all the transactions fail. 
And this way, there is no way somebody uh, get treated. Like necessarily, either the exchange will happen or the exchange will not happen. So that's a very neat feature of Algorand that you get for free and it costs nothing. Okay, so this can be used for smart contract, but we really don't have time. Uh, just a quick example of uh, a kind of smart contract uh, you can do, a crowdfunding smart contract. So like think about a Kickstarter, but a decentralized version. So if you know Kickstarter, essentially somebody can uh, propose a project with a fund goal to reach and an end date for the funding and donator can fund the project. And at the end, if the fund goal is achieved, then all the fund goes to the creator. And otherwise users are reimbursed because the creator would not have enough money to fund, uh, I mean, to do anything. And you can do that using like Kickstarter in which case you trust like some central party or to really do it properly. Or you can create a smart contract. And when you create a smart contract, you don't have to trust anyone except the smart contract. Uh, and the way it would work on Algorand is that uh, first uh, you would create a smart contract and the smart contract would store in global state like the date, like the information about the crowdfunding, the start date, the end date, the fund goal, and so on. And also the current funding receipt. So at the beginning, this is zero, but as people uh, send money that they do by uh, sending like a transaction to a smart contract and sending the money to the application account. So as, as people send money to the smart contract, uh, the current funding receive increase. And also the smart contract store in the local state of the donator, the amount that was given. And at the end of the day, if the funding receive is larger than the goal, then the project creator can send a special transaction that will pay out like all uh, the, the payment, I mean, all the money to them. And if the fund, yeah, oh. Uh, let me answer the question. I saw a question, let me answer just after this. If the, if the funding is, goal is not rich, uh, then each user can come and claim uh, back to be reimbursed and that essentially works the same way. The reason why each uh, user needs to claim back the reimbursement is because you cannot really like make thousands of transactions. You never want to make thousands of transactions on the blockchain and act, uh, at once. And usually it's impossible. And in addition, um, most blockchain do not allow you to um, magically issue transaction without in uh, external interaction. So whether it's on Algorand or Ethereum, you need something to trigger an action of a smart contract from the outside. So that's why you need this, uh, this, uh, these tricks that uh, people need to claim back their funds. But that's really a classical way of doing it on terms of the blockchain. Okay, so there is a, a very interesting question is, does atomic transfer essentially eliminate the need for DEX? Uh, DEX are decentralized exchanges, like uh, this is a way to exchange a different token in a decentralized way on the blockchain. Um, not completely. Like it's very useful if uh, you want to exchange with your friend or not necessarily friend, but uh, the advantage of a DEX is that you don't need to uh, find the person you want to exchange your token with. Like you don't necessarily have a friend or knowledge of someone who want to exchange a token with you. So actually you still have a uh, decentralized exchanges. It makes sort of sense to have them to allow easily people to uh, exchange token without having to find someone with true token. tokens. It's the same as um, uh, let's say you want to sell your car. Either you try to do a small uh, announce, uh, a small uh, post like in the, the New York Times, and you hope that people will contact you and then you exchange securely the car for, with the money. And like the atomic transfer will ensure that the exchange between the car and the money, I mean, assuming the car is something on the blockchain, which is not the case, but uh, if it was in the blockchain, you could exchange it like completely securely using an atomic transfer, but you still need to find the person to whom you want, who want to buy your car. So the DEX allows you to do that much easier. So actually, yeah, 
uh, actually, I, I can show you now. Okay, I don't know why I went that far, uh, but I can show you now uh, one of the decks on Algorand, which is Tiny Man. Okay, wait. So Tiny Man is very similar to uh, Uniswap. If you know Uniswap on uh, on um, Ethereum, so if I want to exchange, for example, my algo from some USDC, the first thing I would do is I would connect my wallet. So here I'm using my algo wallet. Oh no, I'm not using my algo wallet. Sorry, I'm using algo signer. Like we have multiple wallets. Sorry. So here it asks for my very secure password. Okay, I grant access to Tiny Man to my access to my wallet, and then I use a certain of one of my accounts. And now let's suppose I want to exchange a uh, ten algos. Uh, yes, for whatever number of associated USDC, I can do it this way. I select the algo, the USDC. So all of this is a website, like. Uh, we did not interact with the smart contract yet, really. This is just a website that just show uh, the state of the smart contract, but there is no, like I did not actually myself interact with the smart contract, but the, to actually do the exchange, I will need to interact with the smart contract. So we need to send transaction and to send transaction, remember you need to, I mean, before sending a transaction, you need to say, sign them to be able to approve them. And the way it's done is using this wallet uh, uh, algo signer. So if I click the swap button, uh, algo signer pops up again. If you know Ethereum, the equivalent of algo signer on Ethereum is MetaMask. And so algo signer asked me uh, whether I approve the transaction. And then once I approve them, he asked me whether I want to sign them. So now I'm signing them. And oops. Okay, so amazing. So that's unfortunate uh, that there is a bug, but normally <laughs> it should have exchanged the algo uh, with um, uh, uh, the USDC. This is a testnet version. So that might be a, an issue just on this testnet version. It's not the real version. The real version actually works. Um, I don't know why the testnet version doesn't work, but doesn't uh, matter. But this is the idea that uh, that you the way you would interact in a smart contract in the real world with Algorand, for example, is you interact through such a website that then uh, creates a transaction to interact with smart contracts for you, and then ask you to sign them. You sign them, it sends them, and it executes the smart contract. Okay. Um, uh, I think maybe I sh no. Let me just give a quick comparison with uh, with Ethereum. So, essentially, if you know come from Ethereum, there are a few differences. But the main differences are the fees and the storage and computation power. So, at a very high level on Ethereum, you pay a lot of fees. The fees depend a lot on the smart contract complexity. It depends on congestion. And as Hugo said, since uh, Ethereum is a proof of work and is very limited, like it, the block size is much more limited, the amount of traction you can make is much more limited. You have lots of congestion. So, you have really fees that are very high. Like on February 2022, it was more than $10 just to send a token. Like, yeah. And the opposite algorithm, much higher transaction per second, almost no congestion. And in addition, the price of smart contract is not more, like you pay the same amount whether you have smart contract or not. Uh, and the cost is like less than 0.2 dollars, essentially. Uh, actually, now it's even less than 0.1 dollars. Oh, sorry, sorry. I said 0.2 dollars. No, no, it's not 0.2 dollars. It's less than 0.002 dollars. <laughs> we are missing two zero here. Uh, Sorry, my bad. And anyway, the, you in exchange for this uh, very low cost and uh, very fast, uh, but also, sorry, I forgot to say, also much faster to uh, to run the transaction and to commit the transaction and the transaction is immediately final. In exchange for all of that, the algorithm smart contracts are slightly more limited in terms of storage. 
because uh, on Ethereum, essentially, you have unlimited storage as long as you pay, but you pay quite a lot. And it's also limited in terms of computation. But I want to say that I would say that most, almost all applications should work on Algorand. Maybe you need to think a little bit more sometimes, but almost all applications should work on Algorand. But it's true that things that are very, very, very complex might be more complex to do on Algorand. Things that are extremely complex might currently be impossible to do on Algorand, but very soon it should be. And honestly, I have not yet seen a meaningful smart contract that would not work on Algorand, apart from smart contracts that are related to zero knowledge. Like this would be like, I would say the only thing right now that is really blocked is you cannot do this kind of zero knowledge uh, private transaction smart contract on, it, on Algorand. Okay, I'm done. Amazing. Uh, thank, thank you guys so much for the presentation. So yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, feel free to jump in. If we, we may have one uh, time for one more question, if anybody has one. Yeah. Uh, um, um, yeah, just if if there's no question on oh, the chat. Kevin. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, OK. <laughs> Kevin, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Kevin, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, the lights are. But anyways, um, if we were interested in reading more about um, like the technical infrastructure, so like the mathematical proofs for why um, it's secure, is there like maybe a paper we could go to? Yes. Um, I, I, I will send a, a link right now. I cannot uh, okay. write it down, but I will send you a link. I'm, uh, there, there, there is no beautifully written white paper the way you and I would like to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Fabrice, do you have the, the, uh, a link to one of the, the papers? White... Uh, I think I mean... it's the white... So I've sent you the link for all the developer related things. So not really too much the, 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 the technology of, of the consensus. The white paper, I think, are here. I mean, they call it white paper, but uh, they are actually published. Like, it's not just white paper, it's, uh, it's published. But yeah, the, the, um, there is a bit of a difference between what is actually published and what is implemented, because you know there is always a difference between the research paper and the implementation. And so there is a completely uh, uh, like a specification of the blockchain, which is here, but uh, there is no uh, detailed explanation of the, if, how everything works. And the white paper are not 100% matching, but this, they should give you all the high level ID. And uh, if you want something even higher level, uh, the, there are multiple like blog posts which explain uh, uh, the consensus of Algorand at a higher level, like little, like a bit what uh, Wolf did. So uh, yeah, I I mean in the white papers there is the the theoretical paper by uh, Jin Chen and Silvio Michali, and actually it's in, in the white papers page that uh, Fabrice sent. It's called Algorand Theoretical Paper. Uh, if you are very mathematically inclined, this is a good paper. Otherwise, it's a uh, uh, it's not so easy to, to, to follow. And there is the, another paper in this page uh, called the 